secret agents. And uh, because we come to a little portion of scripture, and, and I, today our sermon is entitled, Standing for Truth in Difficult Times, Secret Agent Man. And, uh, and as we look at this secret agent of God, uh, we're going to get to know a little bit about this guy named Obadiah. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, we're not going to talk so much about Elijah today as we're going to talk about Obadiah. Obadiah was not a uh, prophet, but he was one who was in reality kind of a secret agent for God. And so there comes a point in time in our walk with Christ that if we are in difficult situations or we are in hostile situations, you may be called upon to stand for truth uh, boldly. You may be called upon at times to stand for truth as some of our international workers are at this moment quietly undercover as secret agents. And so we're going to engage in that this morning, and I believe God's got something really special for all of us. Uh, so we find ourselves this morning in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 16, uh, and I invite you to follow along as we read the Word of God this morning. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 16. After many days, the Word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. For your benefit, Samaria was at that point in time the capital of Israel. Judah, the capital was Jerusalem, and Samaria was, uh, was the capital of Israel. So, uh, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets, meaning she killed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, It is you, or is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell the Lord, your Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, Have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of that kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, Go tell your Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And as, as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you, I know not where. And so when I come to tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Father, thank you for the opportunity to interact with your word. And as we learn about the life of Obadiah today, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we can see where we need to strengthen our walk with you. May we find and understand the truth that you have for us in accordance with your will through the Holy Spirit today. Guide and direct and speak in your name. Amen. This morning I want us to see two things. First is understanding God's spy. And then the second is going to be standing for truth when the environment is hostile to Christ. So let's understand God's spy. And even as we understand God's spy, we need to understand a little bit about Obadiah. Again, as I shared before, Obadiah was not one of the prophets but rather he was just an average Joe, or average Obadiah, or Josiah, whichever way you want to use it, an average guy that was employed by the king, working in the palace, working in that area. He was a follower of Jehovah. He was a worshiper of God. We understand all of those things about him as he's going to be a, a primary player, although it had been secretively that he was playing out his faith. He's a primary player in what will take place in the life and ministry of the word of God there in the land. So understand some things about this spy. First, Obadiah was good at his job. 
Obadiah was really good at his job. Well, he had to be good at his job. And I mean, we understand that uh, in, in chapter 18, verse 3, it says, And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now, being over the household meant being over the household of, of the king, of Ahab and Jezebel. He was an administrator that was given responsibility to make sure that the, the palace ran smoothly. It, it meant that if there were dignitaries that came in and they had things that they needed to do, Obadiah was the one to make sure they were cared for. It meant that any type of meeting that had to take place, Obadiah was the one who was given that responsibility to make sure that all of those who were supposed to be at that meeting were at that meeting. He was incredibly important in the life of Ahab as he would move and do different things. Not only that, he was influential in the life of Jezebel as well. As he was, since he was over the household, it meant that he had to interact with this wicked queen on a daily basis too. And so Obadiah was one who, who was seen as being really very, very good at his job. As the palace administrator, he had insight, influence over all of the king's life. Can you imagine that kind of role? It's really not so much the vice president that has, the, has his voice being heard in the ear of the president, but it's rather that one who works with him day in and day out. Sometimes it's seen as the press secretary that's always doing the one that's doing in, interaction with him but it's really the one that is over the 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 agenda the daily operation of our president that has i think the most power of sway in their ear and so here a lot here here we have a man named obadiah we don't know anything about him previous to this moment except that he has to be really good at his job you, you, you're not just, he didn't just happen to fall into that place. He was noticed, someone took notice of him that he was excellent in this, in this uh, endeavor, in this area. He had a sharp mind. He was able to deal with difficult situations as they presented themselves. Can you imagine the kind of difficult situations that those who work closest to leaders find themselves in? Think about that for a moment. Some of those things that are uncomfortable for those who follow Christ they would find themselves faced with there are those that have stood alongside and protected those that are in leadership as they engaged in immoral activities how they were able to stand there what they were able to say what they weren't able to do all of those things that inspired Obadiah was one who was given a sharp mind. He had a sharp mind for, to be able to deal with the task. And why do we say that he had to be good at his job? Well, if you reflect back on, on people like Daniel, when Daniel find, would find himself in a place of leadership, which actually got to reflect forward, but when Daniel would find himself eventually being the third in command in all of the land, it was because he, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were seen to have sharp minds, the sharpest minds in the land, and they were placed in those places of authority. Obadiah was one who had a sharp mind, able to deal with difficult situations, able to engage as he needed to in the administrative responsibilities. To have this job, he had to be seen as the best in the land. I don't know about you, but, but any time we, we look at individuals that are going to serve in, in governmental positions, we want the best of the best, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. We want the best choice to be uh, the most qualified, to be the individual that's going to lead our nation. We want the, the best qualified to serve alongside of them. So we don't want someone that, that can't, uh, you know, can't balance their checkbook being in charge of the finances for our, our country. Is that correct? Okay. I, I mean, so we want someone that is administratively sound in, in as much as King Ahab wanted someone that was administratively sound in his service. And so Obadiah was that one who was selected. He, he was... He was really good at his job. Notice something else. Obadiah wasn't just good at his job, but he was trusted by the king. He was trusted by the king. I mean, he is going to be given some responsibilities that, that indicate a trust that is there between the king and Obadiah. Notice what it says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. And, Obadiah, and, and Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of these animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. You see, 
Obadiah's responsibilities weren't just in managing that household and managing that area, but as he gained the trust of Ahab and the trust of Jezebel at times, I could, you could even go as far as to say that, the king gave him further responsibilities. Now here's the situation you and I know very well. Three and a half years have now passed and a famine has, has just wreaked havoc all over the land. Water is, is very, it's very rare. It's hard to find it. People are able to, some people have died because of this. Crops are not growing. And then you have to stop and think about the reality that the animals also are suffering because of this judgment. So the horses and the mules there that belonged in, in the king's, uh, or, or as part of the king's cavalry, they were suffering. And so in this moment, King Ahab is desperately searching now for, for grass for the animals to feed on and water that they can drink. Why? Because if he did not find that necessary component in order to provide health and strength for the horses and the mules, it would impact Israel's ability to defend themselves if a military campaign all of a sudden arose because they were dependent upon horses and chariots in order to help them engage in battle. This was a significant thing. Now, now here's what's taking place here is the king does not ask that individual that is in charge of all the sciences of the land or that individual that is in charge of keeping the horses to go and do this, but he trusts Obadiah so much. He says, listen, Obadiah, here is the dire need that we have, that the nation has at this moment. We need water and we need it for our horses. And so I want to send you on a journey and I am going to go because I really don't know if I can trust anybody else. So King Ahab is going to go one direction. He's going to go to the south and Obadiah is going to go towards the north and they're going to go and they're looking for water. They're looking for springs. If there's springs that are there where water is now coming up, then it means that not only can water be drunk, but it means that there's some green grass that's around there. And this will help sustain us. And this will make sure that we are secure in our military needs. You see, he earned, Obadiah was not just good at his job, but he'd been trusted by the king, earned great responsibilities. To earn the king's trust came because of his faithful service. He faithfully just gave. He faithfully did his job. I don't think Obadiah agreed with his policies. I don't think Obadiah certainly didn't agree with Jezebel's policies. There are a lot of things that, that would happen in the kingdom that Obadiah really did not like because he was a man who was a worshiper of Jehovah. And so he saw the wickedness that was there. He realized, he knew that the, the famine in the land was because Israel was being judged by Almighty God. Because the king and the queen were continuing to lead them down a pathway of worshiping false gods, of worshiping false idols, and in fact, those who were promoting the word of God were going to be put to death. And Obadiah certainly did not agree with all of those policies, yet he still maintained faithful service there in the king's household. And because of that, he earned the trust of the king. Third thing about this spy is this. Obadiah was that devoted worshiper of God. Clearly states here twice in, in this passage of scripture that he was a worshiper of Jehovah. In, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse, the last half of, of, chap, of verse 3 and uh, verse 4, and then also in verse 12, uh, which I don't think will be behind us, it says, Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And then Obadiah's own testimony before Elijah says, And so when I came to tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Now, what do we know about, what does this say about Obadiah? He was a faithful worshiper of God. You see, it had not been outlawed by the king. You could not go and worship Jehovah. That had not been outlawed. In fact, it had not been outlawed that they could not travel to Jerusalem and go to the temple and worship there. Rather, what had, had taken place is a, a, uh, a sanctuary or a shrine had been created there in Samaria and one up in, in, the town, up in Dan so that the children of Israel would not go all the way down into to Jerusalem, into the land of Judah, and, and there worship Jehovah. That was what they were trying to avoid because of the separation. They put all kinds of high places or cultic worship places centers all over the land of Israel. And so it had become a, uh, well, there had been a plurality, if you will, of worship that was taking place. And the children of Israel had been engaging in it. And this was the sin that was, that was taking place. The great uh, 
offense to Almighty God. In those Ten Commandments that he gave, he said, you will have no other God before me. You will not make an idol in any, in any way, shape, or form. All of those things the children of Israel were engaging in. You'll remember a few weeks ago we talked about the fact that up in Dan and down in Samaria, that there in those two locations, that they actually had built two different idols in the form of calves, and they had been told, these are your gods that led you out of Israel, or led you out of Egypt, worship them. But since it had not been illegal, it was not illegal to worship Jehovah, it was not illegal, illegal to celebrate the feasts of, of, uh, of the Lord, all of those things that a, a Jewish worshiper would continually do, celebrating the Feast of Passover, f- celebrating tabernacles, and, and the Feast of Pentecost, all of those various feasts, I believe that what we can understand about Obadiah, since he lived within 30 miles of Jerusalem, that there were moments when Obadiah would travel to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah. He would not worship there in Samaria. He would not worship up in Dan because he would not apostate himself. He would not make himself be a part of that which was not holy. The Word of God tells us that Obadiah was a devoted worshiper or follower of God. And so he faithfully worshiped God. Something else about Obadiah is that he faithfully offered his sacrifices to the Lord. You see, if you are a faithful worshiper of the Lord, if you are a faithful worshiper of God in that day and time, it meant this. It meant that not only did you participate in the daily prayers that would happen in the morning, in midday, and in the evening, three times a day. How do we know this? That was Daniel, what Daniel would do. It was prescribed. There was a morning prayer that we understand would happen every day uh, there around the temple morning time of prayer. There would be a midday prayer in which they would pray and they would gather together and pray. And then there would be an evening at the end of the day, yet a third time of prayer. And so we can, based upon what we understand was the habit of those who followed uh, Jehovah God and what we understand of what we see in the life of Daniel, who likewise would find himself standing for truth in difficult times. Obadiah must have been of similar cloth. He must have been the same type of individual that in the morning he would begin at the time of prayer, he would go before the Lord and he would pray. And what would he pray for? He would pray for the coming of the Messiah. At midday, he would gather himself again wherever he might be and he would turn and face wherever Jerusalem was and he would pray that second time. And during that prayer, he would offer praise unto the Lord and and worship unto the God who, who had led the children of Israel out of Egypt declaring his allegiance to him and him alone. And then at the close of the day, once more, he would find himself facing Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Because that's where the temple was. That's where the ark was. That's where worship was to take place. He would face towards Jerusalem where that temple was. And third time, he would pray unto the Lord. This was his daily habit. This was what would communicate that he was a devoted follower. He would make the appropriate sacrifices that were necessary, which is why I believe that Obadiah would travel, since it wasn't so terribly far for him to go, that he would travel on occasion to Jerusalem, and he would make the appropriate sacrifices. Maybe once a year during the, at the time of atonement, he would go and he would make sacrifice for himself and for his family. Maybe he would go during the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Pentecost, and he would celebrate down there in Jerusalem because he was a devoted worshiper of Almighty God. He would give unto the Lord financially as he would take those sacrifices to the Lord as well. He was a faithful worshiper. He faithfully offered the right sacrifices to the Lord. Third thing that we see about Obadiah is this. Obadiah learned from the prophets. He learned from the prophets. Now, let me set the stage for you, if I can, and help you understand a little bit of what was taking place. We read a few moments ago, twice it says, that when Jezebel was killing the prophets of God, what did Obadiah do? He collected a hundred of them, and he put them in two different caves, separated them and put them in two different caves, and he would provide for them bread and water throughout this famine. Now, we don't know when Jezebel started killing the prophets of God, but all we know is that she started killing the prophets of God and Obadiah who knew what was going on because he was there in the house he was there and was privy to all that was taking place long before it began when he heard Jezebel make the suggestion and Ahab would say go and do what you want to do honey you can you can kill them all I don't care I love you you know when, when that kind of a conversation would go on Obadiah who was there in the house who was over the household was at the right place at the right time recognizing there was no way for him at all to be able to save all of the prophets because it was zeroed in on the prophets of God. Now, why the prophets of God? 
Jezebel was so angry at what God was doing, at the judgment that was there, because she was one who was worshiping Asherah, one who was worshiping Baal. She was one who was not worshiping Jehovah, and she wanted to blot out any of those who were connected to Elijah. Elijah was the prophet of God who came and said, there will be no rain except by my voice, by my word. And so she would, she would connect what Elijah said to all of the prophets. There were times they, she would go and they would interact with the prophets to find if they could somehow, some way, tell them where Elijah was. And so it's not happenstance that Jezebel would look at the prophets of God and say they need to be killed, we need to cut them all out. Why? Because she wanted to continue to promote Asherah worship and Baal worship. So if you take out all of those who are the servants of God then the worshipers will no longer worship because she'll be able to say, you see, your God's not powerful enough to save their lives. So worship Asherah with me. Obadiah hears all of this, and Obadiah is going to go, and he's going to separate these prophets, and he's going to protect them, and he's going to feed them. He has hidden them. I don't know if it's for one year, two years, all three and a half years that this took place. Nonetheless, Obadiah saw this as his mission, as his ministry, and so he did it. Can you imagine the kind of conversations that would take place as Obadiah would, would, would come and he would provide something for these men? As he would walk into that cave that no longer was just a cave, now it had become a tabernacle. It had become a place of worship because those 50 men of God were there. And you know what those 50 men of God were doing? Well, they were living life and they were praying and worshiping God. I mean, I, they had to have been praying and worshiping God. And Obadiah was careful to identify different followers of Jehovah who would come alongside of him and help provide what was needed, water and bread. It's going to be a lot of water and bread that he needed to provide for 100 people. Two different locations, probably separated from a, for a distance so that if one set had been found, the other would still be preserved. And so Obadiah would learn from the prophets. He would, he would engage in conversation with them as they would engage in worship with Almighty God. We cannot help but believe that that was taking place. Have you ever spent time with with someone who who knows the Lord, that that you were just kind of the benefactor of just being in their presence day in and day out? You gleaned and learned from them. Obadiah was that who gleaned and learned from those who were followers of God, those prophets of God that he he had protected. So he interacted with the prophets. Fourth thing we see about this this spy is that Obadiah had courageous faith. He had courageous faith. I think we can say that pretty clearly. In verse 13 it says, Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in in a cave and fed them with bread and water? That had to be an incredible undertaking. I mean, think about that. Maybe the first month wasn't so hard. Maybe, Maybe the first year wasn't so hard. But as you got to three and a half years... He's having to find water where others aren't getting water. He had to find bread where where people weren't able to make a lot of bread. And he was providing this for them? He knew at any moment that if Jezebel found out what he was doing, not only would he lose his life, but 100 prophets instantly would have their lives taken from them. This was courageous faith. He believed that God had brought him into that moment, into that location, into that ministry for that time so that he could now protect and provide those who would become the teachers for Almighty God, those prophets who would, be, who would continue to spread the word of God after Jezebel is off the scene. That took courageous faith. I wonder if he didn't also recognize the fact that if he lost his life, that maybe God would raise him back up in order to protect these ones. He knew that what he was doing was dangerous. He knew that that what he was doing was risky. But he knew his God. He saw that that serving God was bigger than his position. He recognized, just as Esther would recognize, that for such a time as this had he been brought to that location and into that job. He saw that serving God was greater than the risks that he was engaged in. And he saw that God that serving God is as being more important than even his own life. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, my friends, if you and I see serving God in that way. If we see serving God as, as being bigger than our particular job or position that we have. I wonder if we see serving God as being greater than the risks we may have to take for him. I wonder if we could say that we see serving God as even more important than our own lives. 
I believe there's coming a day, my friends, when you and I will find ourselves having to, de- to, to make a decision, will I stand for Christ or will you take my life? It wasn't too long ago that we, we saw the news, we, we ripped on the headlines there of this international worker that happened to be what some would say at the wrong place at the wrong time, having a cup of coffee with someone else. It had been just a few, uh, been a few months prior to that particular moment when, when, uh, when he would lose his life because of a bombing that happened at a coffee shop, that he would be preaching somewhere here in the United States and he would preach a sermon about being willing to risk his life and lay his life down for the cause of Christ. At that moment, that man was not out sharing Christ. He was having a cup of coffee with, with someone else who loved Jesus. And yet he lost his life. Why? Because he had come to a point where he said that my life means nothing in comparison to Christ. He could have said, just as Paul did, for me to live is Christ, but to die is even greater. You need to understand God's spy. You see, God's spy is one who is good at their job, is trusted by the king, devoted worshiper of Almighty, but is one who is courageous in their faith when they recognize appropriately that serving him is more important than anything else. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder in 2016 if you and I have that kind of perspective where we could honestly say that serving God is more important, is greater than anything else in our lives. Or I wonder if there's still that hook from society, that hook from culture that it tempts us to say, serving God is greater than anything else except this. Except that. If you want to understand God's spy, you need to see that the the spy, Obadiah, had the right perspective of God and his relation to him. Second key thought this morning is this standing for truth when the environment is hostile to Christ. I don't think it is a a mistake or wrong for us to say that we live in in a growing society or a society that is growing in its hostility towards Christ. We do. And so, how are you and I to live? As we reflect on the life of Obadiah, I want to draw some very quick application points for you and for me. How can I live for Christ in a job that is hostile to Christ? How can I live for Christ in a community that is growing in its hostility towards Christ? How can I live in a neighborhood where there is hostility towards Christ? How can I live in these times? There are three things I want you to see. First is this. You and I, if we're going to stand for truth in, in when the environment is hostile to Christ, then we need to live above reproach. We need to live above reproach. Now, what do we mean by that? If you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 to 15, the apostle Peter is writing, and this is what he says. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Stop right there. Let me kind of put it into vernacular for you and for me. The way you live among those who live in Raleigh, keep your life pure. In the word commendable, what he's talking about there, it's something that everyone in your community, everyone that's around you would say, look at them, that's the kind of life to emulate. So make sure, check your life, and see, are there things that I do? Are there things that I'm a part of? Are there things that I post? Are there things that I allow into my life that, would, would not, that others would not want to point to me and say, imitate that? Is my life truly one that is living above reproach, living above condemnation, living above the wagging tongues of society that would say, I wouldn't want myself to be, my son or daughter to be like that. Like it or not, men and women, you and I are role models for the rest of the world to follow if we're following Jesus. But if we're not following Jesus, then we are no different than the rest of those that are here in the world that are following and doing their own thing. Peter goes on and says, they, he says, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. Be subject to the Lord for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So he's going to push it a little farther. Whether it be to the emperor uh, uh, as supreme or uh, to governors as sent, I'm sorry, 
or governors, as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now what's he saying here? Bottom line, follow the laws. Don't be a lawbreaker. Actually live in obedience to the law of those that where you're living. You may not like the law, but live in submission to it. On April 15th, there are a lot of people that really don't at, at all in any way, shape, or form want to write that check to the IRS. But you and I have a responsibility, yea, a command from Almighty God to write that check to the IRS, whether we like it or not. It's out of obedience to Christ that we're doing that. In humility, we sit underneath those who are, have been placed in authority over us. You say, but, but they're going to take and use my money in ways I don't want. You know what? Then you need to get involved in the political process and help see the, 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 the tide stemmed that way. But until that time, that there some laws have been revoked, you have a responsibility by Almighty God to live in obedience to those that are in authority over you. Pay your taxes. Obey the speed limit signs. Don't steal from someone else. That means that when you have your, your iPod and, and, and you've bought that music, uh, make sure you've paid for that music. Don't just, don't just take the music from someone else's iPod and, and use their, their listening track because that's thievery. You've stolen someone else's song if you haven't paid for it. I realize it's only 99 cents. But it's still sin. And young people, if you've got an iPhone or an iPad or whatever it might be that is filled with, with, uh, with songs that are on those, uh, those share places, you need to go and purchase those songs from someplace else because you're robbing, you're stealing. So, boy, you're pretty square, aren't you? You're pretty, you're, you know, that's, that's really backwards. There have been a time in my life where I didn't live in obedience to that, and I reaped what I sowed in that area and I saw other things that others when they saw that I had not held that to that high level of scrutiny that they looked at that and saw that as permission to go and embrace some things they should never have been embracing you say it doesn't matter I say it does and more than that God says it does Live above reproach. Don't give anyone any reason to be able to say anything negative about you. Your character should never be called into question. That's what living above reproach means. So don't compromise your faith. Don't compromise your values. For these are that which, which God has entrusted into us. He has woven into our lives. He has been teaching us from his word. Don't compromise in those areas. I don't care if everybody else at work or everybody else at school is doing it. It doesn't mean that it is right if it's not holy, if it's not pure, if it's anything that is opposite of what God's Word says. Live above reproach. You know, one of the greatest things that someone could say of you is, oh, well, you know, we didn't ask you to do that or be part of that because we knew you'd say no. I remember, I remember when, uh, when I was in, in high school, um, I grew up in a time where you know, in my, in my home, we didn't dance and we didn't go to movies at that point in time and, and, uh, and we didn't drink. And, and so I remember in, remember my, in high school, so, you know, in the choir room as we're talking about what you're doing and they said, you don't drink, you don't dance, you don't go to movies. What on earth do you do on a date? I said, well, we have fun. Well, what do you mean by you have fun? Do you, do you have sex? No, we don't do that. Don't you like girls? Yes, I like girls, but that's, we say that for marriage. Really? Yeah, yeah. Why do you do that? Well, because God's word, to, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and this is what God's word says. And, and I'm living in obedience to my parents. My parents say we're not to do X, Y, and Z, and so I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z and disobey. Really? Yeah. Well, that's strange. Yeah. It wasn't very long after that that uh, I would find out some friends were out and hanging out and had gone somewhere, they'd gone to do something, and, and they would say, yeah, well, Sean, we didn't, we didn't invite you because we knew you'd say no. Why would I say no? Well, because we were doing X, Y, and Z. Oh, well, you're right. 
Well, what's the difference? They knew my life at that point. I, I wasn't hiding anything. They knew that out of consistency, I lived a certain way. And, and so they knew not to... I mean, I remember when a, a, uh, I was accused of lying or cheating or something uh, for whatever reason. And I remember sitting in class, in the class as this particular teacher was accusing me of not doing something. And three different students stood up and said, you can say that about anybody else in this classroom, but you can't say that about him. Because that's not how he lives. I didn't say anything. I just sought to live out faithfully what I understood of God's word as a 17-year-old. But it was impacting those that were around me in that classroom. See, see folks, you want to live above reproach. Don't give your neighbor a reason to call the cops on you. Don't steal their paper. Don't let your dog poop in their yard. I mean, don't, don't, don't let those things happen so that your neighbors will turn and they will actually praise you instead. Live above reproach. If you're going to stand for truth when the environment is hostile to Christ, then you need to excel at your job. Excel at your job. I believe with all of my heart that the best employee at any particular firm, at any particular location, and the best students in any school should be Christ followers. I really believe that. I believe that at every level, regardless of where you work, regardless of where you live, whatever school it might be, I believe that a Christ follower should give 100% the absolute best that they possibly can, and they should be the upper tier in every place in society. Why? Because in our service, in our work, whatever we are doing, uh, whatever our job may be, or where we're at in school, all of those things, we need to recognize that what I am doing, I'm not just doing for myself and my family, but I'm doing it as an act of worship for Him. Because if I'm going to come and I'm going to give a crappy job, then people are going to look at Jesus and say, well, He must be a crappy God. Excuse me if you don't like that particular word. But the reality is, how I live, how I function, how I work has an impact on what people think about Him. And so you and I need to give our very best in everything that we're doing. I want people to look and say, man, I want to hire those individuals that go to your church because they are the best in society. I can trust them because they're not going to steal from me. I can trust them because they're going to turn their iPhones off and they're actually going to engage in work. I can trust them because they're not going to be surfing and watching porn while they're at work. I'm, I can trust them because they're going to show up and do the job. In fact, they might even work a little longer. I'm going to trust them because, man, their character is flawed. I love that. That's the kind of person I want. You and I need to be the best at our job. And so, my friends, excel at whatever job you might have. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us this. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. This is what enables me at times when I have had a secular job. This is what enabled me to work and do my very best when I didn't care for the manager I was working for. You can do the same thing when you recognize that you're not working for that manager. You're working for him, Jesus Christ. You may not like that teacher who is giving you those assignments, and you may hate the assignments that you have to do, but if you will excel at what you're doing, young people, understand, if you will excel at what you're doing, and you recognize, I am doing this for him, it's going to impact your teacher. It's going to impact the, ref, the, the, uh, the opinion that she or he has about you that will then be shared around the school that you are at. It'll either be, you really don't want them in your class, or, boy, you want more like that one in your class. Excel at what you're doing. Live above reproach. Third and finally is this. How does all of this happen? If I'm going to stand for truth when the environment is hostile to Christ, then like Obadiah, I need to be more devoted in my walk with Christ. I need to be more devoted in my walk with Christ. Now, how do I become, you say, now, pastor, you said that, that Obadiah was this. Yeah, I believe that the moment that King Ahab and Jezebel, and they started all of their stuff, and Elijah had said, here's the, here's the word of the Lord, famine is coming, no rain, and this is going to be bad. I believe that what Obadiah did, rather than just, rather than running from God, it forced him closer to God. 
You see, times of testing and times of, of, uh, of stress and strain should draw us closer to Christ in, in our intimacy with Him and our fellowship with Him and our walk with Him because we recognize that apart from Him, we can't do anything. We can't stand up under the stress. We can't stand up under the trial. We can't endure any of those things. But by Him and through Him, we're enabled to face very difficult things in life. And so it's incumbent upon you and me to go to the source who can and will strengthen us when we are called to stand for truth in difficult times, when that hostility is ever-present. So where do I do it? I do it in four ways. First is this. I do it in prayer. It is in that time of daily prayer where God will speak to you and He'll speak to me. And I mean prayer that is beyond just, Lord, bless this food, or now I lay me down to sleep. I mean some time during the day where you interact with Almighty God and you are praying unto Him and say, Lord, here are the needs in my life and here are the things in my life. Lord, I pray for my neighbor who doesn't know you. Lord, I pray for my family in this situation. Lord, give me wisdom. There is not a day that goes by but what I am saying, Lord, would you please give me wisdom today? Would you please give me wisdom today? Would you please give me wisdom today? I don't want the decisions that are made to be the decisions that were conceived in this brain because this brain is flawed. But I want it to be that which is given to me through the Holy Spirit that I can then live and do and be what He wants me to live, do, and be. And that comes as I am spending time in prayer with Him. It doesn't mean that you have to get up at 4 a.m. and spend the next hour in prayer and then you get ready for the day. Although if God leads you to do that, blessings on you, my friend. I'm a nighttime person. I don't mind praying at midnight. Maybe that's you. Maybe you want to spend the evening pray in prayer. It, it, it's, it's not about how much time you spend in prayer as the fact that you are regularly devoting some time in prayer with Him. Second is this. I'm not just devoted in my prayer, but if I'm going to be more devoted, it's going to be in private worship. You see, it's in these moments of worship that we are embraced by His presence. It never fails that when I spend time with the Lord in private worship, as I have prayed unto Him and I am declaring His glory and I'm, I'm driving down the road and I, I hear a song and I'm singing a song unto the Lord, I, it never fails but what I feel the embrace of Christ take place in that moment. You see, it says in God's word that he inhabits or he dwells in or lives in the praises of his people. And so you and I, if we want to experience the presence of God in our life, then you and I should every day not just spend time in prayer, but we should spend time in worship, ascribing unto him the glory that's due his name. And let us be enveloped by the presence of Christ. Notice the third thing. Being more devoted in our walk with Christ comes as we read and meditate on his word. You see, it is in the reading and the meditation on His Word that we gain fresh vision and direction. When I've prayed, and I, I, tend to, I tend to start with prayer before I read God's Word, I'll pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open my heart and mind that I might receive what He has for me. And, and then it, it never fails. God always says something to me. Sean, this is what's going on in your life. You need to get that out. Sean, I thank you so much for what you're doing in your life. And, and, and here's more. I want to I bless you in that way. And so there are those kind of things that happen. And I see it in God's word as I read and as I study. And I see things I need to apply. It happens every day. Every day then I open his word. Fourth is this. I need to be intentional in my spiritual development. You say, now wait a minute. I thought you were already doing that in what you just talked about. Well, I'm going to push a little bit differently here because all I've spoken up to this moment is private. See, I believe spiritual development goes beyond the private to the public or the collective, if you will. Hebrews will tell us, don't give up meeting as some are in the habit of doing, but let us continue meeting with one another, spurring one another on to love and good deeds. You and I need one another. We talked about us needing that relationship. And so if I'm going to be more devoted in my walk with Christ, it will require that I become intentional in my spiritual development. And by that, it means that spiritual development is going to take, uh, and depth is going to take intentionality. That I decide I'm going to engage in, I decide I'm going to study, I'm going to decide I'm going to be part of. I need to be more faithful in my weekly worship. It means if you, if you can't make it to church on Sunday, then you need to make sure that you are meeting that spiritual need somehow, some way, where you're faithful. In, when, if you're in town, then you need to be here, not because we want you to come and just sit here and listen and worship with us, but because you need the body of Christ. 
You need the interactions with one another, and you need to hear the teaching of the Word of God. We need that collectively. So be more faithful in your weekly worship. Third idea is this. Join and participate in a small group of some sort. It is in small groups, whether that be a Sunday school class or that is a a, a weeknight group somewhere, it's in those small groups that you and I can open God's Word and we can interact at at a closer level, one with another. How is this fleshed out in your life? How is this working in your life? How is this, how, how are we doing these things? You and I all need those times where we are being held accountable by one another. And if the only accountability that's happening in your life is from this spot right here to you out there, that's not accountability. That's me, that's you and me having a one way conversation where you're sitting and you're listening and I'm doing all the talking. But it's in those small group times where, where you get into God's Word and you're able to ask questions. What is really being said here? What's that mean? I don't understand. And, and is there something back that's behind all of that? My friend, you need, if you want to be more intentional in your walk with Christ, if you want to be more intentional in that development of your spiritual life, you need to plug into some type of small group. It's why we have them. Finally, look for ways to serve within the body of Christ. It's not enough to always be sitting and soaking. It's not enough to always be taking in. But you need to be giving out. I believe that every person that attends God's church, whether it's First Alliance Church or it's First Baptist Church, every single follower of Jesus Christ, it's an expectation in their walk that they are not just receiving, but that they are serving too. And if you are one that is not serving, that is a key component in your walk with Christ that is not developed. You need to start serving. Finally, use your position and influence wherever you may be as being on mission or on post for Christ. Change the culture of your company. Change the environment at your school. Raise the bar of excellence Raise the bar of integrity. Raise the bar of faithfulness, of teamwork, and the like. Raise the bar of faithfulness to, in your walk with Christ. Instead of it being, you know, kind of looked down upon, have those that you know, those that you interact with, let them also come alongside of you, and, and when, when one, two, three, four, and a dozen begin to stand for Christ, it changes the environment of the company that you work in or the school that you attend. Because... When you have more strings that are connected together, it's harder to break that cord, isn't it? One of the greatest things that you can do is to find that one or two or three or ever how many there may be at that place of work that love Jesus Christ and they're there to serve, that you can be an encouragement to one another as you are standing for truth in a difficult or a hostile place. My friends, we've encouraged you to pray for our our high school students and middle school students and our, our elementary school students. Listen, school is not like it was when you and I went. They are in the devil's den. There is more immorality and ungodliness that takes place in those schools. You would just be shocked if I sat and told you all the things that I know that's going on. And those that stand for truth in in those locations are ridiculed, are looked down upon, and that's not just by the students, but they are ridiculed by the teachers and the staff. And they, are, sh- they are, 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 are hushed in what they say. They live in a hostile environment. And students, you need others who know Jesus Christ as Savior, who are walking with you down those hallways, who are walking with you and standing for truth and saying, I'm not going to be in, in, in support of that. And I'm not going to go and be a part of that. It means a lot of lonely days. It means a lot of weekends in which... You don't get to go and be part of what's going on when you stand for truth in those places. But you will be honored by your faith. God will bless you. And in the end, it will be so worth it. There are times when you and I are called to be very public in our faith and times when we are called to be private. Times when we need to be that secret agent. the turn of the, or in the late 1800s, horrible things that were happening here in the United States. 
as one people group was enslaving another people group. And there were men and women, both those who loved Jesus and those who did not love Jesus, who said, we need to help provide a place of safety. And the Underground Railroad was put into action. And there were men and women that, even today, you don't know who they were, that provided a place of safety and security for those who had been enslaved, who were seeking freedom, risking their lives. Those that were down in the far south where, where slavery was, was embraced and accepted and all of those things, and those individuals that tirelessly, quietly hid those slaves provided transportation, means for them to escape. They're heroes. When Nazi Germany was at its height, think about Cory Tin Boom and all that took place in the hiding place. There were believers all over Germany and all over Poland and those areas that would build secret rooms within their homes so that they could hide Jews because of the atrocities that were taking place. Most of us are familiar with the story of, of Schindler and, and how he, he engaged, by, uh, he engaged in, in, in protecting Jews and, and providing safety for them by creating a, a factory in which none of the products were actually put into use. He made really poor bombs. And yet every person that worked at that factory was a Jew. And at the end of the war, as, as, as they were now being released and let go, he began to look around and he would see all of those that were on that list, Schindler's list, and he would see all of those who had, sacrificed, who, who had been saved as because of his sacrifice. And, and he would go around and say, I, I could have saved more. We could have saved more if I had sold this, if we had gotten rid of this. This was one person, another person's life, another person's life. You see, in that moment, they recognized the evil atrocities that were taking place and they took a stand for truth in a quiet way that said, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. These men, these women, they are heroes. Obadiah hid the prophets quietly. He's a hero. My friends, you are on mission for Christ where you work and where you go to school. Will you stand for truth in that environment? Be that publicly or be that privately? Will you stand for truth? You bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. May we stand boldly. May we at times stand boldly yet quietly in the shadows, providing safety and security for those who need it. Father, that's going to happen as we yield ourselves to you and allow you to transform and change us into your likeness. It doesn't just happen. It takes intentionality in developing our walk with you and learning to be obedient to the voice of God. So may we do that. Would you raise up Obadiahs in our church, in our community? And through us, Lord Jesus, would you change the culture where we work, where we live, where we go to school? Change us and change the culture. Help us to stand for truth.